Hi, Freddy. Hi, friends. I thought I'd take this opportunity to revisit the evolution topic, which oh. is a favorite of mine. Now, what would you do? Look me right in the air. Oh, listen, this is a simple one. This isn't going to be a long video it's either. Never simple, Eric. Never the biologists ever. who want to overhaul evolution. A half century's worth of scientific discovery since the last major update to evolutionary theory has some researchers, researchers pushing for a paradigm shift. Leland and a like-minded group of biologists argue the modern synthesis needs an overhaul. That's to be recast as a new vision of evolution, which they've dubbed the extended evolutionary synthesis. Uh, the biologists have pushed back hard, saying there's little evidence such a paradigm shift is warranted. So... to turn up the tribe. Alright, so these researchers apparently <laughs> don't argue that the modern synthesis is wrong, just that it doesn't capture the full richness of evolution. Organisms inherit more than just genes, for example. They can inherit other cellular molecules, as well as behaviors they learn in the environments altered by their ancestors. Leland and his colleagues also challenge the preeminent place that natural selection gets in explanations for how life got to be the way it is. Other processes can influence the course of evolution, too, from the rules of development to the environments in which organisms have to live. It's not simply bolting more mechanisms on what we already have. It requires you to think of causation in a different way. So, here to talk about epigenetics and the sort of Lamarckian understanding of things, which says that the reason giraffes have long necks is each generation, the mother stretches her neck a little bit longer and it becomes a little longer and so her kids have a little bit longer necks with no explanation of the mechanism, right? Um, so it says here, in one study, researchers were able to trace down altered methylation patterns for 31 generations in a plant called Arabidopsis. And this sort of inheritance can make a meaningful difference in how an organism works. Arabidopsis. Um, in another study, researchers found that inherited methylation patterns could change the flowering time of Arabidopsis as well as the size of its roots. The variation that these patterns created was even bigger than what ordinary mutations caused. After presenting evidence like this, Jab Lanka argued that epigenetic differences could determine which organisms survived long enough to reproduce. Natural selection could work on this system. While well, natural selection is an important force for in evolution, the speakers at the meeting presented evidence for how it could be constrained or biased <coughs> in a particular direction. A number of species of lizards have evolved feet and that have some lost toes. Some only have four toes, while others have just one, and some have lost their feet altogether. The modern synthesis leads scientists to look at these arrangements as simply the product of natural selection, which favors one variant over others because it has a survival advantage. But that approach doesn't work if you ask what the advantage was for a particular species to lose the first toe and the last toe in its foot instead of some other pair of toes. The answer is there is no real selective advantage. Uh-oh. <laughs> Development may constrain... Oh, well, let's see here. The key to understanding why lizards lose particular toes is found in the way that lizard embryos develop toes in the first place. The bud sprouts off the side of the body and then five digits emerge, but the toes always appear in the same sequence. And when lizards lose their toes through evolution, quote-unquote, they lose them in the reverse order. Muller suspects this constraint is because mutations can't create every possible variation. Some combinations of toes are thus off-limits, and natural selection can never select them in the first place. So... The modern synthesis, which is to say what everybody understands evolution to be, would lead you to look at the adaptations in a smart weed plant as the fine-tuned product of natural selection. The plants grow in low sunlight, then natural selection will favor plants with genetic variants and let them thrive in the environments. This smart weed is a very interesting plant because smart weed plants adjust the size of their leaves to the amount of sunlight they get. In bright light, the plants grow narrow, thick leaves, but in low light, the leaves become broad and thin. In dry soil, the plants send roots deep down in search of water, while in flood soil, they grow shallow, hair-like roots that stay near the surface. Scientists at the meeting argue that this flexibility, known as plasticity, can itself help drive evolution. It allows plants to spread into a range of habitats, for example, where natural selection can then adapt to their genes, quote-unquote. That, that part being um, an interesting leap, right? Because it, this, this notion of plasticity destroys the mechanisms that evolution relies upon to make its explanations, which it fails to make consistently in a way that's consistent and doesn't conflict with other explanations that it has. This is the problem I have with it. This is why I identify that it fails 
before I started reading about it at all. It doesn't make any logical sense. So, um, scientists at the meeting argued this flexibility known as plasticity can help drive evolution. Another talk, Susan Anton, a paleoanthropologist at New York University, said the plasticity may play a significant role in human evolution that's gone unappreciated until now. That's because the modern synthesis has strongly influenced the study of human evolution for the past century. Paleoanthropologists tended to treat differences in fossils as the result of genetic differences. That allowed them to draw an evolutionary tree of humans and their extinct relatives. This approach has a lot to show for it. By the 1980s, scientists had figured out that our early ancient relatives were short and small-brained up to about 2 million years ago. Then one lineage got tall and evolved big brains. But here's the problem. Um, paleontologists would find variations that were harder to make sense of. Two fossils might look in some ways like they should be in the same species, but look too different in other respects. Scientists would usually dismiss these variations being caused by the environment. We wanted to get rid of all the stuff and get down to their essence. But that stuff is now too abundant to ignore. Scientists have found a dizzying variety of human-like fossils dating back from to 1.5 to 2.5 million years ago. Some are tall, some are short, some have big brains, some have small ones. They all have some features of homo in their skeleton, but each has a confusing mix and match assortment. This can help explain it. This extended evolutionary synthesis can help make sense of this profound mystery that evolution doesn't explain at all and is contraindicative of the predictions of evolution. In particular, she thinks that her colleagues should take plasticity seriously as an explanation. <coughs> to support this idea, Anton pointed out that living humans have their own kinds of plasticity. The quality of food a woman gets when she's pregnant can influence the size and health of her baby, and those influences can last until adulthood. What's more, the size of a woman, influenced in part by her own mother's diet, can influence her own children. Biologists have found that women with longer legs tend to have long, larger children. Um, but here it says here as well. Um, the extended evolutionary census may also make help help make sense of another chapter in our history, the dawn of agriculture. In Asia, Africa, and the Americas, people domesticated crops and livestock. An archaeologist at the Smithsonian gave a talk in the meeting of the long struggle to understand how this transformation unfolded. Before people farmed, they foraged for food and hunted wild game. Zeter explained how many scientists treat the behavior of foragers in a very modern synthesis way, as finely tuned by natural selection to deliver the, deliver the biggest payoff for their effort to find food. Note, I talked about this hunter-gatherer bias in a video recently before I read this thing, okay? So, it, it, this was a very satisfying read, needless to say. Um, the trouble is, it's hard to see how such a forager would ever switch to farming. You don't get the immediate gratification of grabbing some food and putting it in your mouth. It's a different set of evolutionary skills. So, researchers switch, suggested the switch to agriculture might have occurred during a climate shift, when it got harder to find wild plants. But Zeter and other researchers actually found no evidence of such a crisis. Instead, they, Zeter argues there's a better way to think about this transition. Humans are not passive zombies trying to survive in a fixed environment. They are creative thinkers who can change the environment itself, and in the process, they can steer evolution in a new direction. Scientists call this process niche construction, and many species do it, including the beaver. But look here. During her talk, she presented slide of after slide of predictions that provides about everything from the movements of early foragers to the pl pace of plant evolution, with this extended census to help make sense of domestication, right? But at the end of it, somebody stands up and says, um, Shuker says, could you comment at all on the mechanism underlying this discovery? Noble stammered in reply, the mechanism in general terms, uh, you'd have to go back to the original paper. All results demonstrate that natural selection can rapidly rewire regulatory networks. So it's a perfect, beautiful explanation of a rapid neo-Darwinian evolution. Okay, so... That's what the abstract says. Shuker is pointing this out. That's what the abstract says. But he points out that there is no understood mechanism beneath the conclusions expressed by this and ignores the reality that the mechanisms provided by the modern synthesis <laughs> don't explain anything adequately or at all, frankly. And they... There's a refusal to define species in a meaningful way. 
that would allow us to actually understand what speciation means, that it is a defense mechanism against the indefensibility of the argumentation of evolution. If you don't believe me, and you think I'm just full of shit, then watch some of my other videos on evolution and understand the following thing. Number one, I am not a religious person who's advocating in favor of a creationist understanding of things. I don't have a counter-advocacy. I don't understand how it works. And neither do the scientists. That's my point. So if you think, if you use evolutionary <laughs> explanations for things like, oh, well, this was this way because it gave us some sort of an advantage, well, that's not what the actual data shows or science shows at all. And it's not what any sort of logic shows either. And I've researched it extensively. So if you want to come and debate me about evolution, come debate me about it. I would love to debate anybody about that. Nobody, everybody wants to argue with me in the comments and shit about evolution, but nobody wants to actually come debate me about it because nobody can adequately defend it. They don't even know what it says. You, I'm telling you, if you think you believe in evolution, it's because you don't know what it says. If you did, you'd realize there's nothing to believe in there. It's a, set, a whole slew of contradictory shit. Self-contradictory shit. You don't know what to believe in. If to believe in it, it requires you to believe in mutually exclusive notions. Or to choose one camp over the other, even though no camp adequately explains anything. So, that's how it is. Another nut camp. Right. It's a nut camp filled with geneticists who have good genetics science and not anything to do with evolution. There's no explanation of the increasing complexity that works. There's no mechanism underlying evolution that actually explains where speciation came from. It's not possible under the conventional understandings of things. So, sorry, that's just how it is. And it's like, I don't understand why people are so attached to evolution of all things. Why? It's a shitty explanation.